This episode is sponsored by Realtor.com, who wants you to take advantage of your free profile on Realtor.com. By claiming and completing your free profile, adding a photo, and all of the information that puts you head and shoulders above the competition, you're on your way to receiving free leads, helping search engines find you, and staying top of mind with past clients. To learn more about claiming your free profile, go to realtor.com forward slash profile. Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Real View podcast. I am your host, Allison Wiley. Joining me today is our special guest, Clint Scutan. He is the Senior Vice President of Organized Real Estate at T360. He leads T360's Organized Real Estate Consulting Division and is responsible for all of the company's Realtor Association and MLS activities. He has over a decade of real estate industry experience, including as CEO of a realtor association in Colorado. He helps realtor associations and MLS clients refine their organizational structure and execute more effective strategic planning. And you may remember him from our MLS forum at this year's convention. He joined us there and was able to talk to some of our listeners, as I'm sure, at our convention this year. So Clint, welcome onto the show. We're so excited to have you. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Great to be on. And as we were talking in the, the pre-session, you know, we initiated this conversation seemingly like six months ago. I think it was like two, but the way time goes, man, it, it seems like it's been a long time. So happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, as we mentioned, you know, you were at convention and I think we were on the initial call to talk about what you were talking about at convention. So yeah, it has been a while, but, um, Rightfully so. I mean, we have so much to talk about. So much is going on um, in in your world, in our world. So I'm um, going to be just a really timely conversation, and and we're going to dive into all of that. But before we get started on on the MLS and where things stand and where we're going, I want to hear a little bit more about you, your career journey. Um, you know, I mentioned kind of in your bio just some of the things that you did before you got to where you are today. But let's hear a little bit more about you and how you got started in real estate. Well, like most happenstance, you know, no one grew up saying this is exactly what I was going to do, but uh, I've had a kind of interesting career arc that actually, you know, upon looking back on it, it all stitches together. So I started out doing talk radio, did that for about 10 years, just doing local issues and being involved and engaged in my community and learning a lot. You know, you, you learn in that environment to do a lot of prep for the time that you spend. I know you know that with this podcast. Everybody's like, oh, it just takes 30 minutes. Like, no, it's much more time than that. So we did that for a number of years. And, and after a while, kind of got tired of talking about things and wanted to get more engaged in actually doing community-minded work. And uh, so I initially jumped in kind of to the association world, working with the Doctors Association, worked with them for a couple of years, and then shortly thereafter, caught on with the Realtor Association, did that work for for just under a, a decade and and then have been doing this consulting work now for about five years. And even when I was a, an AE managing an association in, in an everyday environment, I was doing consulting work on the side because some of the systems and processes that we had developed, you know, it was something that I was sharing with some of my peers around the country. And so I was getting to travel and do some work. In fact, I've done a lot of work in Ohio. Cleveland is one of my initial clients going back now, geez, six, eight years ago, right about the time that, that Akron and Cleveland merged. And so so it's been interesting to, to do work with them and, and see a merged entity grow and kind of iterate and become a single entity from two different ones. And, and it, you know, I think as we'll probably come back around to later, that's really, really important because regionalization is really kicking back up right, up right now in terms of what's going on in the association and MLS environment. Yeah, and you're right. We are going to talk about all of that, and I can't wait to dive into this conversation. Tell us a little bit about you know what you do at T360, some of your roles and responsibilities. You mentioned some of the different um, associations and things like that that you uh, worked with in your role and background, but specifically maybe when it comes to MLS, tell our listeners kind of your experience and, and um, what you're responsible for when it comes to the, the MLS and, and everything over in that aspect. 
you know, I'll start with an overarching view. T360 may be recognizable for some, but not all. But uh, one of the most, you know, um, public facing aspects of what T360 is as a, a research and publications and events uh, group is we've done trends reports for a number of years. Stefan Swanenpol is one of our three owners and um, has been a part of now, I think, coming up on 19 different trends reports, was involved with the danger report that some of your listeners might be familiar with that was uh, issued through NAR. So, so our publications really were the most public facing aspect of our, our company, but we have just um, shy of about 45 um, uh, company members now. And we do all sorts of work across residential real estate from, as I mentioned, events planning to brokerage strategy. We've got a, a, a technology division, uh, executive hiring and talent division. And then I oversee what we call organized real estate, which is associations and MLSs. And um, so we do a lot of work. Much of that revolves around research as well as advice. We do an annual publication called the the Almanac, Real Estate Almanac, and included in there are a number of stats about brokerage, um, per, you know, um, uh, outputs and, and the sales volume and all those things. Um, there's a technology component to that, and then there's an aspect that that we've become fairly well known for at T360 that's that's um, outlines the number, size, and type of realtor associations and MLSs, and so we do that in coordination with the Real Estate Standards Organization. Really, up until we we started this work about five years ago, especially as it relates to MLS, there was a lot of, um, well, there are this many MLSs, but the, the this many would vary just as much as the number of people who were responding. There really wasn't a clear understanding of how many MLS organizations there were, which is ironic when you think about the MLSs are supposed to be, you know, timely, accurate, <laughs> data oriented. And we didn't even know how many of us existed. So we've been doing this research now for about six years. So that, that that's a, a lot of our work. And then, you know, um, we do advisement, direct advisement with clients, uh, MLSs in particular around, you know, strategic strategic uh, considerations, expansion work, technology decision making, um, and just general kind of, you know, business strategy. So that, that's a lot of where we spend our time. And we're fortunate to see a lot of best practices from around the country. Yeah, thank you for that. That's super helpful, I think, to give context, you know, around your perspective. And and as, as we discuss some of the things we mentioned that we're going to be talking about today, I always like hearing, you know, where people come from, you know, what their experience is just gives good context to the, to the conversation. So thanks for that. And, and I mean, you guys have done a lot of work with Ohio Realtors too. I know, you know, aside from you being a part of our uh, convention, we've worked with um, other staff members over at T360 and I've always had, um, you know, a really great time with you guys and have enjoyed, have enjoyed working on you guys with different projects. And, and I know you've been a partner and, and associated with us for a while. So really great to have you on again. And thanks. Thanks for coming on to talk about this. So let's just kind of dive in. Where the current state of the MLS stands today? What is this landscape looking like? Tell us just kind of where we are right now in in our industry. Well, we're in very interesting times, right? <laughs> um, there's there's more than a couple of things going on, which for us as consultants, you know, who work in this space, you know, under, uh, duress and uncertainty really are are where you know um, we make our our ends meet and where folks see value in us. And so there's plenty of that going on right now. The you know as we speak, the the trial is opened up in in Missouri, the first of several commissions trials. There have been some settlements here in the last few weeks, and and some of those settlements directly having implications for you know the realtor association in particular. But ultimately, I think what it's going to have an impact on long term and and what we're going to be really looking at and I think needing to understand as an industry is, you know, the association's relationship with the multiple listing service. They've been inextricably meshed over the years. You know, associations in large part started MLSs. A few brokerage entities exist around the country, but those two have been one and the same for such a long period of time. And now I think we're being compelled by a variety of aspects to to look at the two entities um, and speak to each of them as a standalone entity. And by the way, I think this is a, that's a really healthy exercise. As someone that comes from an association that was completely separated from our MLS over 20 years ago, from a decision-making standpoint and a financial standpoint, there is life after the MLS for associations. And in fact, I think that life is, is much more directed 
and intentional when you understand that you can't rely on the value of the MLS, which is inherent. I can't argue that, you know, our research tells us when you ask folks, how important is the MLS to your business? Over 97% agree it's either really important or important. And like, we can't get that much agreement on anything. So, (laughs) so the inherent value of the MLS is there. Now the nuance and the value of the association is a little harder to explain. And so there's been some, some, you know, rationale as to, well, we're not going to go into the details of how they're different over the years, but now we're having to really think through this relationship and what's likely to occur on the other side of this is, is that there is going to be a, a greater delineation between MLS and associations and whether that's related to the, the litigation that's going on right now or the FTC or the DOJ. It's a reality that I think organized real estate leaders really need to be thinking through. And, and ultimately, it shouldn't be a fear based decision. It should be an opportunity based mindset. Yeah, I think so, too. That's a great kind of rundown to get us to where we are today. What do you think kind of caused or was maybe the main catalyst as to getting us to this point that where we are today with these lawsuits? I mean, did you ever have a feeling that something like this might come up from your experience? You know, how do you think we ended up in this place that we are today? That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> I know, like, how, how much long do we have the answer? <laughs> yeah, you said we had 30 minutes. Um, I, I think the short answer to that is, is that, you know, it's an industry that's very, very important. It's an industry that over time has been very well organized and has been intentional about how it's lobbied. And of course, the structure of NAR necessitates membership and, and those aspects. And so there's a lot of that that, that is, has been there and is an undercurrent. To me, the, a little bit of the reality beyond that is, is that, you know, there's a lot of politics that goes into this, you know, from the changeover um, between the previous administration to this current administration and how the DOJ and FTC is viewed, not only this ind- industry, but a lot of other large scale industries that impact consumers, that's changed dramatically. And many would say that fuels a lot of the interest in and consideration of some of these lawsuits that then all of a sudden pop up. So, so yeah, there's really big socioeconomic and political entanglements that got us to this place. But I will say this, we have also gotten ourselves here in some ways, because I can tell you in the MLS environment in particular, there are many protectionist decisions that are made from the standpoint of, you know, maybe you have a very special market that you think is unique that outside, you know, brokers and agents, even if they're licensed in the state can't serve. So we've built up these artificial barriers around that, or you want to protect the revenue streams that are derived from the MLSs. And so there have been activities within our industry that has helped to fuel this as well. So we we are not without blame and we didn't get into the situation without some causation, not to say that we were the 100% factor for that. There's obviously a lot, but, but yeah, there, there's been some decision-making over the years and practices that haven't always aligned with what I would say is in the best interest of the totality of the marketplace. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, when we look back and think about what's led to us to where we are today, there's so much that goes into it. As you mentioned, it's not just one thing. It's not easy to just, you know, place the blame into one place. You know, there's a lot that's got us to this place. But no matter what's going to happen and what the outcome of this trial is going to be, and even more so into the future, what should we be doing in the meantime? I mean, as as the association, as MLSs, as realtors, What should we be doing in this uncertain time and what is the best way that we can prepare ourselves to be ready for whatever the outcome of this trial is going to be? Yeah, one is paying attention and, and learning and listening and, you know, being thoughtful about that. You know, I understand and, you know, done work in, in your state and have shared back, you know, some of these lawsuits. And when, when some agents in particular and brokers first learn about this, it's like, there's no way this is completely not in the best interest of the consumer. And I can't believe we're doing this. And so they'll just shut down on it. And unfortunately, again, this isn't all about practicum. Some of it is politics and, and all these other pieces. So, so listening, learning, and anticipating, I think, are really going to be important, whether we like what's happening or the potential outcomes of these items. You have to be working in front of it and and not acting from a standpoint of, well, I don't like it, so therefore I'm not going to go along with it. And so that's at a general practitioner's level, you know, just making yourself aware, being smart and, and being proactive. From the work that we do from an association and MLS standpoint, I work with partner Liz, who's in my division, and um, we've done a couple of recent presentations around preparedness. 
you know, and we, we think that, um, you know, MLS is in particular because there's so much at the heart of these legislative activities and, and litigative activities that they need to be the ones to be thinking forward. And so going through your strategies and understanding that compensation is a primary aspect of your strategy or if it's even included in your vision statement, it's likely that, that compensation is not going to be as prominent, if at all, a part of the MLS's value proposition. So doubling down on the cooperation aspects will become important. Important. Understanding that from a strategic standpoint, starting to go further down into, you know, the idea of how might this change the buyer's agent's relationship with the MLS? What types of technologies do you offer? What kinds of things do you have now that are out there as products that, you know, might need to be raised up in terms of that value proposition to retain those buyer's agents and making sure they understand the value of participating and leaning heavily into that cooperation aspect. We really believe that the marketplace is much better when there is this co-opetition environment that we have where there's this, you know, um, collaboration, to, but yet ends up with competition. We think that's good for practitioners. We think that's good for, for consumers and the general marketplace. So understanding those aspects and how you might, you know, incentivize cooperation beyond these changes that are coming. We're really, really encouraging MLSs to think through and even associations to some degree to think through your revenue diversification strategy. Right now, we're in a headcount based model. So we are heavily dependent. And this isn't, by the way, just associations and MLSs. The industry really has this brokerages are set up. You know, the more people we have, the better we are. Longer term, it's not a healthy environment right now. You know, we know when we're calculating and looking at you know, the number of listings in an organization, we run a, 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 you know, a number against that. And I can tell you that number is not the number of agents times one point something other. It's less than one something. So it's, it's a percentage. So there, there are more people than there are listings. And that's, that's an environment that ultimately doesn't work out. So the headcount model is going to be challenged. We think, and, and we're doing a research project now, right now around this, where we understand top line revenue constraints for the, uh, the MLSs. Right now, MLSs are, uh, as 522 of them are making about half of what several recognizable MLS data related companies are making as a single entity. So we're revenue constrained, even in the current headcount model, unless we want to double our, our fees, which I don't think anybody's open to doing overnight. We've got to figure out revenue diversification strategies that allow us to find new ways to, to monetize things. And, and we think data is pure gold, right? And it has been for a number of years. How do we use that in a responsible fashion to help practitioners, but also to help inform the marketplace? And then ultimately even to inform decision-making that occurs around the housing market. We always hear about, you know, NAR stats about the amount of revenue that's dumped into a community with each housing purchase. And that's because the home purchase is the central aspect of, of how of wealth that movement around the country, but it also influences a lot of other activities from the types of development that need to occur in a community, policies that are made by city councils and state legislatures to retail outlets where they're going. So we think there's there's an amount of data that and in terms of an amalgamated data set opportunity that if we bring that together, we can compel folks to cooperate and we can find ways to monetize this responsibly, that we can move away from those headcount models and, and, and maybe even reduce or, or, you know, in the long term, if we're really successful this, what if, what if the fees went away because the, the data was so valuable? So, so we're trying to orient folks towards the idea of charging what it costs to deliver the data. And then also starting to realize, you know, beyond just the immediate needs to fulfill the transaction, what are those value props for the data that we possess and, and how can we responsibly monetize that? Yeah, that's really great. And all something that, you know, we can be thinking about in the meantime, and while we're waiting to see, you know, the outcome of this, think about what our future is going to look like. Think about creative, new, exciting ways to to just morph our business into something that is may, might look different, but um, is going to just elevate us and make us so much better. And I like what you mentioned too earlier about you know, just the approach that we have on this, approaching it from a positive mindset, approaching it, you know, in the right way that it's not all doom and gloom, because I think we hear so much of that and reminding ourselves to stay positive, that we will come out of this, that, you know, the industry is not just going to go away overnight, but this is a, just a new way to evolve ourselves and take us to the next level. So I think the mindset of that is is so important. So I like that you brought that up too, to, to 
make sure you're being aware of how you're approaching this and thinking about this, because this could be a huge opportunity, you know, and I think for um, the associations and the MLSs that see it and view it as this opportunity, that they're going to be the ones that come out of this whole situation so much better and stronger and, and really help propel our association in, in our industry into the future. So going to be really interesting. And I'm excited to see, you know, kind of what what happens, you know, with this all, what some of those ideas and new ways of doing business look like moving forward. I think, as I mentioned, there's a big opportunity. So really excited to to hear about all of that and love the creativity and the new things that you're suggesting. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-license course locations. What should happen if if compensation changes? And, and, you know, we mentioned kind of the new ways that we should be doing business, but if this is going to change, you know, if our way of current business is going to change, what should happen? What should we be prepared for? How can we, um, you know, be, be ready for this? And what do you think our world is going to look like after this? There's again, there's a number of directions I could go with that. I'll, I'll choose to go a direction that we're already seeing energy building for, and I, I noted it earlier, regionalization. We think that that's really going to become an important um, mindset and, and not just a mindset, but a recognition amongst leaders who are making decisions. And so I mentioned we track the number of uh, associations and MLSs, and we've been doing that now. We'll be going on our sixth year of this data. In the five years, 2018 to 2023, what we saw was a fairly significant decrease in the number of organizations. Um, we started out, you know, tracking nearly 650 and we're now down to 519. But of note in particular during that time was that decrease, especially around MLSs, largely came from smaller entities simply choosing to join larger entities. And so there's some rationale around this that, that's market driven, right? We, we use this light emissions map, which I think we shared with your, your folks um, at the, the event where light emissions equal housing, equal, you know, commercial property. And, and where, you know, there's a continuum of lights, there's essentially a continuum of a marketplace. And those marketplaces don't align with our realtor association chartered areas. And MLSs have recognized this for some time. We've seen more regionalization around MLSs and those types of activities occurring, but it hasn't happened to the full degree to where it's, it's recognizing that marketplace. So we've started to see some of that activity, especially with the pressures of, of you know, in the MLS environment, delivering data and technology at a high quality and high level. It takes resources to do that. So we've seen a lot of smaller entities that are running into larger marketplaces over the last few years saying, okay, we're going to join up with those folks and we're going to, you know, just join in on an established regionalized structure. In fact, we saw going into 2018, about 90% of all MLS organizations were below the average size of 3,500, which meant only 10% of organizations were above that. Now, the difference here is that the big are really, really big. In fact, you know, 20 MLSs serve 50% of all subscribers in the country. Wow. Yeah. And so what we've seen is those smalls were joining up so much so that now that 90-10 proposition in five years is down to about 80-20. So only about 20% of the organizations are above the average and about 80% are below. So we saw that concentration of smaller entities. What's happened in the last six months is we've returned to kind of more early 2000s or early 2010s activity where regionalization was occurring then. And so like-sized entities were getting together to create a single entity to serve what is largely a regional marketplace and to become larger in capacity. And for a long time, we didn't hear a lot of those conversations, but I think with the energy and the pressure and the potential change, again, in the number of subscribers, you know, the difficulty in, in explaining the value proposition of a collaboration-based MLS versus collaboration and compensation is driving a lot of folks now to, to talk to each other. 
and to start to think at a broader regional capacity. So when we start to look at regionalization, you know, I, I really would encourage leaders to get familiar with, we really think this is an important thing to understand, what we would call combined statistical areas. It's a Census Bureau area that's made up of metropolitan and micropolitan areas that have grown together, that each have uh, over a 15% overlap in employment, transportation. So in other words, it's, you know, cities that have grown together, three to five of them that people live, work and play in between those cities. And so long as we have MLSs that serve each of those cities, we're out of alignment with the marketplace. And so there are about 170 of these combined statistical areas that we think if if we were thinking in the right way as an organizational standpoint, we should regionalize in a similar capacity. And then ultimately, from a collaboration and a data revenue standpoint, like we talked about earlier, then we've got to connect all those nodes. And we've been pointing folks towards, you know, if you look at the way in which fiber has been dropped around the country, major fiber lines, you can connect all 170 of those together through those fiber nodes. We think the data in the real estate environment should be flowing the same way. And then, you know, that relates then down into the associations. If we're really separating these two out, associations allow MLSs to think at a regional capacity from the regional marketplace. Then the associations can continue to think about and representing local voices through their advocacy work, which becomes more important on the other side of any of this, you know, outcomes of these trials or FTC or DOJ involvement. The the advocacy work at a local and a state scale to me become much more valuable. And so to do the professionalism concerns, because now we've got a broader marketplace where most folks are having to work together. There are gonna be some creative strategies, business strategies from brokerages to survive on the other side of this. No, no harm, no foul on my standpoint, like that's what they gotta do, right? But the association's there to think about consumers, to think about their members and ensure that professionalism is being handled and that we have that coopetition spirit retained, that we're being collaborative and, and still competitive at the same time. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Again, I'm trying to look at it from that lens of there's a tremendous opportunity here if we can start to see things outside of just our local marketplace, what I've known before, and start to thinking about it, everything in a regionalization capacity where we either consolidate to, to reflect that or we collaborate in a way that, that facilitates it. It sounds like uh, there's a ton of benefits, you know, that if, if we did see this consolidation happen and if we did kind of simplify almost in a way, right, the MLSs and we are all working together to provide this information, it sounds like just so much is going to be able to be streamlined and that we're all going to be able to just work together in a more efficient manner is what, you know, I kind of see if we think about why we would do this and, and the benefits of that. And is that something that you guys are feeling, you know, confident that this is going to be a trend that's going to stick around, you think, into the future? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think the regionalization is, is, a, is a clear trend. And, and what happens is, you know, with, as the regionalization is happening, we also have hyper regional and national strategies that are at play that are starting to interlink various regions. You know, so so your region in particular, you know, if you look at your in migration and out migration, you're starting to feel pressure from coastal areas coming in East Coast, West Coast. And then folks that are, are there now are, are moving southward. And so these regional nodes, if you will, still have connectivity beyond just the immediate marketplace and because people are more transient than they have been before and so we have to think at that capacity so so yeah we we think that regionalization thinking against broader national connectivity strategies are, are really really important to be sure and can't really set that aside the other thing that that we think is really really important against this is to to look at regionalization different than we did consolidation of the early 2000s and 2010 because you mentioned a really important word, efficiency and better decision-making. And as we look back on some of the consolidation that, that's transpired, some of the largest consolidations that happened in the U.S., if you look to Canada, didn't create efficiencies. In fact, they just facilitated and continued redundancies, but in a single environment. It didn't streamline decision-making. It didn't enhance our ability to act quickly and think quickly as organizations in this space against all the changing environments that we're dealing with. So, as we think through regionalization, you know, what we think is, is is putting this together is important, but jamming it together without making it better on the other side is a fallacy and might actually end up causing us some harm. So, yeah, we think those these things are, are going to be driven by natural marketplaces. Again, we're a reflection of where people are, are living, working and playing because that all relates back to where they, they spend money on real estate, whether it's housing or, or whether it's commercial 
all this is happening. And so for us, it's really hard to believe that we can buck societal trends with our decision making. Yeah, definitely. And I know one of the things too, then the slide speaking of this is coming back to me from our convention is that there was a slide up there that said that people are moving now 50 miles away from their original home. And I thought that was a fascinating stat. And I had never really seen that, you know, in in um, our day to day lives as realtors and what we do here at the association. And I think that is fascinating. Does that go back to this re- idea of regionalization? Is that just another proof point as to why this might be kind of the direction that we're going to head in? Because I thought I saw that stat. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's kind of crazy. 50 miles. That's a long way to go from home. Well, it is, you know, and yeah, that's an NAR stat that showed in 2018, the average move was 15 miles in radius. Now it's become 50. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, again, if you see it, especially, you know, in a visual capacity, Mm -hmm. you understand the difference. But but yeah, this is what we've seen. And, and, And as you guys are starting to understand and feel in Ohio, because you're attracting folks from these coastal areas, I'm in Colorado. Like we did this like 10 years ago where we attracted people from coastal areas. Colorado is now the most expensive non coastal state from a housing standpoint because these folks come in with housing wealth that they bring to these other places they inflate your cost of housing and that you now you're seeing this replicated those folks also come with very different understandings of what their live work and play environment looked like someone coming from a highly condensed metropolitan area or even california that maybe isn't as metropolitan but it's just like suburban all the way they were used to commuting 45 minutes and they didn't go that far. Now they come in like in Colorado where I live, I'm about 45 minutes north of Denver. Our marketplace, they come here, they say, I can live in Fort Collins, which is a smaller city, still access my job in the Denver metropolitan area, get more bang for my buck in that from a housing standpoint. I still only have to drive 45 minutes and I get to live two different lifestyles. That actually sounds like a bonus to me. That's coming to many of your metropolitan areas as you look at who's coming in. You have folks now that are that are coming in from Chicago. You know, we imported a lot of folks from Chicago who are now returning, interestingly enough, um, if you look at migration patterns, which are really important for real estate folks. I know you don't always get at that macro level. You're more at a micro level. But raise your head up a little bit, do an environmental scan, especially for an organized real estate decision maker, because these are your naturally occurring marketplaces. It's not just those folks that are now driving to the edges, drive till you qualify. It's the folks that see you as their potential next landing spot. Yeah, definitely. And I know that that's a big focus for the state of Ohio. We had on our director of development here um, a few months ago, and she talked about, you know, launching this national campaign as to bringing people from outside Ohio of Ohio into Ohio and why they should come here. And, you know, we were having this influx of job growth that's going to pull people here from other states. So, um, yeah, definitely important. Something that everyone should be taking a look at is where those people are coming from and how we're going to be ready for them, because I think it's coming, um, you know, with, with with the developmental projects that we have going on here. But um, Clint, this was so fantastic. I want to thank you so much again for coming on. Um, truly just a wealth of knowledge. I know I've learned a lot and I know our listeners have too. And I'm um, going to be interesting to see where we are in the next couple months. But with your perspective, your optimism and your ideas on where we're going to be headed into the future, I think we should all feel, feel good about where we are and um, good about where we're heading. So thank you again for coming on and sharing with us all of your knowledge. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for for having me on. And yeah, I say to folks, you know, think forward, think positively, um, and what you focus on expands. Yep, absolutely. Great way to end the show. So thanks again, uh, Clint. And to all of our listeners, thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back with you next week. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time.